Welcome to Startup Simplified, RJ. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. Uh, thanks for, uh, for much for, for having me, Bipin. How are you? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Thank you so much, Chief. So uh, just to set up a background, uh, we've been doing uh, this uh, series where we've been speaking to a lot of founders, uh, mostly Indonesia-based founders. And uh, that's when we thought that, okay, hey, listen, let's speak to some venture capitals as well, right? Let's get their perspective. As well as let's give our audience an understanding of how the world of venture capital works, mm. right? So, so far we've spoken to folks who specialize in pre-seed funding like Capital, sure. uh, seed funding like Trihill. Mm -hmm. uh, in today's episode, we want to basically touch upon how Sison is different sure. uh, from a fund perspective. Uh, we also want to understand uh, how funding at different level works for you. Mm -hmm. Right, because you do across pre-seed, seed, A, B, right? Yes. Uh, so that's that's the core uh, agenda, sure. right? That let's let's get let's get more scoop about the venture capital world. Right? Sure. Uh, let's let's quickly start with a very brief introduction of yeah. who you are, where you come from, sure. how long you've been in Indonesia, how long you've been doing this. Okay. So a very very brief intro about more of your journey so far. Sure. Uh, love to start that uh, start that off with a little introduction of myself. Uh, so I'm RJ. I'm a Filipino by nationality, but born and raised here in Indonesia. Right. I spent my whole life here, except for college and one year abroad uh, in the Philippines. Uh, pretty much my whole life has been in finance. Started with Batik IB uh, consulting, uh, and then I eventually rounded up in VC in 2018. Uh, this is with a company called Mungsil Ventures, a Singapore-based fund. Uh, after four, four to five years there, I joined uh, Bananas, a quick commerce startup here in Indonesia. Uh, and actually that well, uh, had a little bit of trouble uh, taking off during uh, COVID. Uh, so I decided to leave. And uh, yes, now I'm here with Saison uh, for the past seven months. Nice. That nice. was a brief introduction about me. Awesome, awesome. Before we get into the venture capital world, uh, I'm very intrigued by uh, quick commerce. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, sure. uh, it, it has... It, it took the world by storm during COVID, uh, in not only Indonesia. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, the same has been applicable in various growing countries as well as developed economies, right? Uh, what are your thoughts now in hindsight, because you have some experience out there? Mm -hmm. What do you think what went wrong? And what do you think what is going right with, uh, with companies which are still on to that direction? I think it's a combination, a buildup of a lot of things that we did not pay attention to, both from the startup side and also from the venture capital side as well. Sure. Uh, I think the ones who suffered here the most are probably the users who got spoiled by all the uh, amazing deals. Uh, this includes, you know, even the likes of uh, GoPay, uh, OvoPay, uh, and how they were also abusing the kind of uh, cashback systems as well back in the day. Mm -hmm. I think this it was a a, a whole total journey of what happened after the dot-com bubble until now. Uh, basically, we didn't really learn from our mistakes. We, we basically made this whole industry uh, revamped and over-supplied with companies that were also overvalued. Uh, and what we didn't focus on were fundamentals. Just like any business, fundamentals are key. And this is something that we did not focus on whatsoever. Uh, going up to the point, uh, basically mid-COVID, which is around 2021, 2022. Correct. So this is exactly what happened with quick commerce. The idea itself is, is quite great. There's a lot of people who forget to buy things, who need things last minute. Uh, for example, uh, if you have a child and they need something for their project, a science project next, uh, the next morning, uh, you can't really go anywhere at 10 p.m. It's quite hard. However, these companies that, was, uh, that were there at the time, like Astro, Bananas, Drop Easy, amazing companies at their time, uh, they provided a really good service and what we like to say uh, created real value. Uh, giving you uh, whatever you needed in less than 15 to 20 minutes because you were on a deadline. However, we didn't realize that a lot of these things nece not necessarily needed 15 or 20 minutes. Number two, the unit economics, uh, as a lot of people uh, did say, uh, did not just make sense at all. So the business fundamentals were not there, even though the value that they were creating was quite substantial. Uh, fair enough. I mean, uh, just, just my thought, okay, I, I'm neither an expert in this industry, uh, but uh, neither, neither or uh, or I have been closely associated with it, right? But what I personally think is that the that the TAM which was calculated was was too big. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, I don't think it's that big a, a, a TAM. Mm -hmm. uh, also, in terms of, let's say, a GMV uh, out there, I don't think it can it can be very huge because as you rightly mentioned, it has to, the products have to be stuff which are maybe used every day mm -hmm. and it's out there missing. That's right. Uh, but at the same time, you're competing with a lot of unorganized players. Uh, like, just to give you an example, uh, be it in Indonesia or in India for that matter, yeah. or in Philippines as well, mm -hmm. you basically just WhatsApp or message uh, your grocery guy who's just downstairs in your apartment. Yeah. Right. And uh, he does pretty much the same thing. He does. I mean, he just gets things to you within, I don't know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Uh, right. I mean, so. Uh, or if you have a maid or a driver or correct. any sort of helper, right? In correct. what country where uh, wages are relatively cheap, it's, it's very common. Correct. Middle class and above uh, families. Correct. Which what uh, these quick commerce companies were targeting, the middle class and above most of the time. Interesting. That's interesting. It. Why do you think venture capitals latched on to this one? I think it was an exciting idea. I think mm -hmm. uh, in the US and in Europe, uh, this idea with a lot of companies I probably shouldn't be naming on podcasts, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, the idea was 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 fantastic, right? Getting things uh, quickly, uh, pumping out GMV. So the the reason why well, aren't these very different geographies you're talking? Let's for example, sure, you're talking sure. about US or Europe. Yeah, you basically, I mean. Uh, there are very secluded communities where right. the where the grocery shops or the large uh, shops are slightly away. I mean, they're at least a 10 kilometer drive yes. or a 15 mile drive, right? So it makes uh, quite a bit of sense mm -hmm. that, hey, listen, you put out a dark store uh, everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Plus, so, and plus uh, again, you don't have the abundance uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, informal uh, workers like we have here. Correct. Who can help you with the, to get your daily items or those missing items, right? Sure. Um, so I think it did work uh, very well in the U.S. and Europe uh, at the time where people did not want to go out because mm -hmm. it was the height of COVID as well. So the whole kind of energy within the space was just tremendous. And this is why a lot of uh, venture capitalists who also did not see a lot of growth in other sectors kind of zoomed in on in the early 2020s uh, to 2021. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. I mean, some of these companies were unicorns within months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Within yeah. months. Yes, so yeah. it was something that we haven't really seen or heard of. Mm, yeah, we haven't heard of it before. I don't think we're going to hear it uh, <laughs> in the, the coming years for a while at least. Uh, okay. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, let me take this conversation from quick commerce sure. and the way venture capitals uh, went about it uh, in a slightly different direction. Uh, you've been doing this for a while now. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, do you think it's very cyclical in terms of the interest in particular sector? Like, for example, there was a massive crypto Web3, yep. uh, quick commerce mm -hmm. uh, uh, boom, which was going on, wherein you had a lot of startups coming into that uh, uh, direction. Maybe they were starting up that because they knew that venture capitals are excited to pump in money. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they really wanted to. But... Uh, what do you think? How does this hype gets created? How does everyone basically just gets into this uh, and you have a lot of money going into one particular segment? I mean, if you could just break down, uh, right? Uh, not talking about you personally or the fund which you represent personally. Sure. But let's say from a, from someone who has a ringside view, what do you think? How does how does this happen? How does one sector get so exciting uh, for venture capital? I think it really depends on the time frame, uh, where you are in terms of the ec economic cycle as well, um, what has been hot uh, in other countries. Because a lot of uh, how Asia has started was emulating successful business models outside of our current, our main countries. Correct. Uh, those in the US, those in, in Europe, for example, uh, we just kind of bring them, uh, brought them here and localized them here. So that's the, probably the first way to kind of follow on a trend or a fad. Uh, which happens quite a lot, quite often. Mm -hmm. The earliest what I remember is the P2P fad of 2018, 2019, mm -hmm. where there were just a slurry of P2Ps. I think 150 plus registered with the OJK. Current, I, oh, I think half of them have survived since then. Yeah, the other ones have sold their uh, licenses. But how these get started is, you know, you have one or two successful business models that actually do well, and you see uh, a flurry of VC money pumping in. But of course, as you know, there's not just one VC. There's at least 100 uh, VCs, other investing arms as well of other companies, corporates, 
uh, governments, uh, agencies as well, who also want to kind of promote this business model so that you just have all these startups and investors kind of pull together their money. And then you just have so many different types of companies, which are literally made within a day, within a week. Yeah. Interesting. So this is exactly how those things happen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being very candid about it. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, let's let's formalize this conversation now. Sure. I think we went on a different uh, track altogether. Uh, let's let's talk about Saison. Sure. Right. Uh, so we were chatting, right? That unlike let's say other funds wherein they have their lending partners, their LPs, uh, that's not the case with Saison. Mm. So let's just let's just uh, give us an idea of how this came into being. Uh, number one. And if you don't have LPs, how does this work, right? How is it different, let's say, from from any other, like Sequoia or, a, let's say, East Venture or anyone else, right? Where they have lending partners, whereas you don't. Sure. So let's just go out there. That's a that's a great question. I think first and foremost, I kind of want to introduce uh, our parent company first, just to kind of give a little bit of context. Sure. So Credit Saison is one of the largest non-bank financing companies in Japan. 30 billion AUM, Tokyo listed. Uh, very active in lending in terms of credit cards in Japan and wholesale debt lending, which has been exported around the world. Uh, so by doing so, yeah, I mean, in, even in India, for example, most of the P2Ps use Credit Saison's money. Also in Indonesia, we have a, a local company here called Peta Saison Multifinance. So we've been around a long time. When Grab opened, Grab Financial was actually a JV between Credit Saison and Grab. So we've been around the ecosystem for a long time. And this is why we justified opening, uh, uh, making our own VC in Singapore uh, it's called Saison Capital in 2019. 2019. 2019. Okay. Since then, we have 100 plus amazing portfolio companies. Uh, we also do funds of funds as well. Uh, we try to help the ecosystem as much as possible, but we don't force anybody to take uh, our money. We don't force any synergies, but we do have uh, access to a lot of capital, which companies in our portfolio and non-portfolio can also uh, take advantage of uh, in growing their business. So just a little bit about um, our company as a whole. In Saison Capital, we are kind of the early stage engine to that mothership of Credit Saison. So why we are different. Um, so the ones that you mentioned, like East Ventures and, and Sequoia, which are amazing VCs, uh, they're what we call uh, vanilla VCs. Mm. Uh, vanilla meaning they take money from different sources. Mm. Whereas uh, a CVC like Saison Capital or uh, Mandidi or BRI, BNI, uh, th these are called uh, corporate venture arms because they take money from usually just one source. Mm -hmm. However, this has changed. For example, Telcom also has different funds that also have different sources of funds. Correct. But in most of the time, if you are a CVC, you do take funds from only one source. Hmm. Uh, so for us, Saison Capital, our only source of uh, funding is from Credit Saison, our parent company. Sure. So that's the number one difference. Um, would it? Would you say it's easier uh, because we only have one source of um, of, uh, of of funding? I think in terms of your time spent, yes, because you only have to manage one. Uh, LP, hmm. which is basically your parent company, right? Correct. And they're already inside. They already see your day to day. You probably see them down the hall. Sure. Compared to a vanilla VC where I was working before, you, you have to spend most of your time to travel around the world, uh, talk to sovereign funds, talk to your, um, uh, your, your, your school districts, talk to pension funds, talk to other corporates all around the world to convince them to invest in your fund. Correct. And that takes a lot of man hours. Hmm. Uh, that takes time uh, from you, from, in, from investments, from your team. Uh, so it's not necessarily a bad thing as, as long as you can build a team, as long as you can kind of divvy up your work. Uh, but of course, it is just much easier if you just have one source of, of funding. So I think it's probably the, the biggest um, the biggest difference. The, the second difference is also kind of how you focus. Uh, when you are tied with a corporate, you usually have one kind of goal in line. Number one is, of course, financial returns. Number Correct. two is how to help uh, their corporate, your parent company, succeed uh, using using technologies that you see in Southeast Asia and in India and in, in Latam or wherever. Mm -hmm. However, when you're a vanilla VC, it could be a little bit different. Uh, from a vanilla VC standpoint, they're free to move around where they fit. So yes, they take money from different sources all around the world, but they're uh, they have the freedom to invest in whatever they want. Mm -hmm. So it gives you a little bit of more independence, which is great. However, there's also some times where uh, those LPs, those various LPs, would ask you, hey. Uh, I'm an insurance company. I gave you $5 million, $10 million. Can you please help me find insure tech companies for mm. me to broaden my products and services for my clients? Sure. So, you know, sometimes you're also working under those different LPs and us trying to satisfy their needs as well. Mm. So there's a lot of facets, a lot of pros and cons, but, but generally speaking, those how uh, those two kind of interact. Interesting. Interesting. So, I mean, I was speaking to uh, others in the ecosystem and they were talking about what kind of returns do they 
commit to their LPs. Mm -hmm. uh, does does that work the same way at uh, Saison also? Saison Capital commits to Credit Saison. That's a that's above my pay grade. <laughs> oh, sure, at the moment. Sure. Uh, no, I'm not asking about the numbers. Yeah. I'm basically asking is the is the methodology the same? Uh, I think I think the methodology is the same in terms of the three metrics that you kind of want to focus on is MOIC, DPI, and IRR. What are these? Uh, MOIC is multiple uninvested capital. Okay. So basically, if I invest in, you know, one the valuations. Sorry, this is exactly the valuations. Okay. DPI is basically the money that you get back per investment. Okay. And per investment. Yeah, per investment. Okay. Or in total as a fund as well. Okay. Uh, it depends on which metric you want to use, and also IRR is just the investment uh, return rate. So. Sure. Uh, basic uh, investment metric. So those kind of three things are pretty much similar to whatever VC or uh, style that you have. Uh, mm -hmm. It's pretty much standard around. Uh, sure. Sure. Unless you promise something different. Uh, this than me. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So the fund started in 2019, mm -hmm. which was I mean it was just before COVID. That's right. Uh, and just before all the madness which happened post COVID in the investment world. That's right. Uh, was it at that time there was a particular focus on a segment as such uh, for Saison? Because I three, see a lot of Web3 in your portfolio. Yeah. Uh, so was that the focus area? Uh, I mean, that's a that's a great question. And, and something that people often uh, confuse us with is that we're a, only a fintech company. Mm -hmm. We're a fintech focused fund, mm -hmm. uh, which at the time we were. Uh, 2019, our strong suit is obviously in fintech. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, in finance. So we obviously want to invest more in fintech so we can give a lot more value. Sure. However, as time uh, passed by, we also noticed that other key sectors were popping up. Mm -hmm. uh, this included B2B, so mm -hmm. like B2B commerce, B2B um, businesses in general, and um, fintech, uh, Web3, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, something that was relatively new, had kind of a boom, now kind of on the downhill. But for us, we still kind of stay vigilant and, and, and looking at the forward um, kind of prospect of this whole market. Sure. Uh, and while everybody is distracted with generative AI and other things, we're still holding strong and still focusing uh, on this on these kind of three uh, categories. Interesting, interesting. So, uh, would you would you say that uh, Saison is a sector agnostic, or uh, there are there are a few sectors where you're bullish and the others you're not sure? Uh, what what do you say? Oh, we're definitely agnostic. Uh, Everyone says that. <laughs> We're definitely agnostic, uh, especially with the focus on fintech, B two B, and Web three. Okay. Um, we've done you know D two C companies in Philippines, everywhere else in the world. However, we still feel that our strong suit is still within fintech, B two B, and Web three. Let's let's go a bit uh, before I get into the, your funding methodology and uh, your due diligence and more. Let's let's talk a bit about <laughs> uh, about. 2021 and the chaos which uh, which followed in terms of very large rounds happening uh, mm -hmm. very quickly. Uh, what 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 are your memories of that time? I mean, you were in the VC world at that point. Uh, what do you think? What was happening at that point? It was an interesting time. I think COVID was announced in probably Q2 of 2020 when people started thinking about it seriously. Hmm. Uh, and then from then, uh, all the events started getting canceled. All the deals started getting postponed. A lot of the uh, portfolio companies uh, wanted money just to kind of survive. So it was a crazy time, but the statistics actually proved otherwise. 2021 was the highest amount of investment that Indonesia has ever received. Correct. Which is $9.3 billion. The following year, 2020, it was 3.5, so less than half. And this year, we're estimated at only 1.5 billion. Correct. Which is just the same amount of money as 2017, hmm. the year before I even joined, uh, which hmm. is a massive bull run in Indonesia. Hmm. So just looking at this, it seemed a lot of people did not know what was going on, meaning the uncertainty in the market usually comes with opportunity. Hmm. Uh, th I think that's, a, that's an old Chinese saying, right? Uh, so what a lot of people did was, as the markets were collapsing, as things were getting very messy, a lot of people invested in companies uh, which they did not know wh where it was going. We did not have a, a, a pandemic like this for a hundred years, I believe. So Correct. nobody knew what was going on. They thought this was going to be a short uh, blip uh, into a kind of a longer term success story for a lot of these strong companies. You know, mimicking the likes of Google and Yahoo who survived the dot-com bubble crash. Mm. Uh, and they became strong companies. So they figured, oh, we should invest in companies now mm. so that they can be strong after the pandemic, which mm. is which still holds true until today. But 
I think people just overdid it at the time. So it was a, a crazy time. It was a crazy time. Yeah, I mean, you could, you could hear pre-seed seed A within a year. Yeah. Uh, which, I mean, I, I had never heard of mm. uh, before this. I mean, where did you spend the money? That's <laughs> true. That's true. I mean, the rule of thumb is to have 14 to 18 months in between rounds. Correct. But having only two, three months in between rounds was just unheard of. Um, hmm. But hey, but uh, in the pandemic, anything goes. Sure, anything sure, goes. Sure. Let's talk about the consequences of 2021 uh, today. Sure. Purely from a startup's perspective, uh, not taking any names, mm -hmm. but let's say one of the startups which basically raised pre seed seed A within a year, uh, and they are struggling right now. Yeah. Uh, what do you think happened? What went wrong out there? Ah. Uh, I think it's just a mismanage of uh, mismanagement of expectations, right? Uh, as soon as you have a, a fully uh, done round, whether it's a pre-seed, a, a seed, or an A, mm -hmm. you know you have expectations and also um, responsibilities that you promise to your shareholders and to your investors. I think what happens is by raising so much so fast, you have you you give them a false sense of uh, kind of uh, security of that you're going to do very well. But the thing about the pandemic is the markets change very, very frequently. The fluctuations between highs and lows go by every day. I think even now we still see a lot of different fluctuations happening in the market. So I think what, what the problem is, um, they may have overvalued themselves at a, at a point where they thought they were going to do well. For example, like uh, COVID testing facilities, right? Mm. At the time they were booming, but now they're mostly closing down. So... They were just valued at the wrong time, uh, at the right place, I would say. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, do you think uh, <laughs> it was a similar case with edtech as well? Because they saw a massive growth uh, during COVID, mm -hmm. uh, thanks to everything being shut. Uh, and maybe the valuations were based on growth further than that. Mm -hmm. But it was either ways uh, a growth which was led by external factors yeah. more rather than your product itself or offering itself. Mm -hmm. Do you think that was the case with education technologies, companies as well? I think the problem with edtech uh, companies in Southeast Asia in general is that there's no one willing to be p to pay for it anyway. So this goes back to the whole topic of fundamentals. Hmm. W regardless of how the macroeconomic environment helps your business grow, if your fundamentals aren't there, meaning uh, who is there willing to pay? Is it going to be the teachers, the students, the schools, hmm. or somebody else? The government, for example, right? Hmm. Those, those are the four actors hmm. within this space. And I think for Southeast Asia, we've learned the hard way that not all of them are willing to pay. Mm, so we're none of them are willing to. None of them are willing to pay. Okay. They would prefer a cheap, cheaper, less quality software that's free, for example, that can be used throughout all the different school districts, right? And this is why they use the likes of Google Classrooms and, and everything else as well. And so I think this is something that we haven't quite cracked yet as a society in Southeast Asia. And how do we actually make edtech work in terms of how do we make people pay and want to pay for something that is very useful? We all know education is very useful. It's just the fact that nobody's willing to pay in Southeast Asia, especially in Indonesia. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So, I mean, uh, taking, taking the chat forward from what happened in 2021, and how it is affecting the uh, the founders now in 2023 because a lot of them uh, they've raised large rounds but uh, uh, but not able to find product market fit and uh, a lot of pivots uh, are happening now mm -hmm. uh, within within the ecosystem at, uh, itself uh, as a fund uh, yourself. Where do you come into play? Uh, let's say, for example, one of your portfolio companies is making a pivot, mm -hmm. right? Uh, now, of course, you made investments in a different strategy altogether at that point of time. Now, there's a change of strategy, maybe change of vertical itself, right? Uh, what goes within a venture capital uh, uh, fund at that point uh, when, let's say, one or more of their portfolio companies are making that pivot? Yeah. What is this uh, like? I think it just means that you have to spend more time with them. Um, okay. As an investor, you have a duty, uh, not just to your own investors, but also to your startups that you promised uh, mm. to help as well. Um, 
very, very rare nowadays do you see a VC just offering money and you just taking it and building something, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Nowadays, you actually also expect them uh, to help you out in terms of uh, hard times. And I think this is exactly what happened uh, during the pandemic. A lot of the VCs started concentrating not on finding new investments, but on helping their portfolio companies, which is very cliche. Uh, but it's actually very true. Mm -hmm. You know, they do have certain expertises. Being on top of the industry, um, that's a weird way of putting it. But yeah. for them to have a bird's eye view of the whole industry, mm -hmm. they can take, they can get bits and pieces of, for example, if you're pivoting into a, a model that you've seen in Latin America, for example, but they're mm -hmm. based in Indonesia, mm -hmm. you, you can take all those learnings from all over the world that you see and kind of pass it to the founder. Of mm -hmm. course, they have to take it with a grain of salt and they have to execute themselves, but at least you can give them kind of a, a little bit of guidance on what they should do because right now they're probably lost and confused. Mm -hmm. And this is the most kind of obvious case for a lot of founders uh, is that uh, they want to pivot, but they don't, they're not really sure what they want to pivot to. So this is where VCs can come in and help with it. with guidance, of course, with help with uh, continuous funding to help kind of see that strategy play, play out as well. Mm -hmm. And of course, connect them to experts in that field if they need to as well. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I think, I think this, this, is helpful. <coughs> this is very helpful for, for all of us, for all the founders, in fact, for any entrepreneur or enthusiast who's who's looking to get into entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. uh, this helps. Okay, let's uh, let's let's talk about uh, Sison's uh, investment theses, if I may say. Sure. Uh, right. So, what are the things which you look at? Uh, and let's talk about each stages. Okay. Sure. So, uh, pre seed, seed, and uh, A, because you do across A, B, until B, right? Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about the eat stage. Uh, sure. What do you look at, uh, be it in terms of numbers, in terms of character, uh, and uh, how does that process go, right? I mean, uh, just give us a ballpark, right? For example, let's say pre-seed, you make a decision within a month, for example. Yeah. Just give an example. So similarly, let's do it for H, right? Let's sure. start with pre-seed. Sure. What is the thesis? What, what do you look at at that point mm. uh, when you're making a pre-seed funding? Sure. So I think from pre-seed... Um, and what's the value? Oh, pre seed. Okay, sure. Um, hmm. Valuation is very subjective. Not sub valuations. Oh, when what is the amount which you? Uh, is there a gap to it? Uh, oh, like see. what okay. kind of investments you make? Um, I think I'll that's very level. also quite subjective. But I'll give you a ballpark figure. Sure. So for pre seed, I think from the ballpark figure itself, it goes anywhere between maybe fifty k to about two hundred k at okay. the very most that I've seen. Um, I think it's very hard to go any higher than that unless you're taking up the whole round, uh, unless you really believe in this, or maybe it's an old time founder that's making something new uh, from your portfolio. In pre-seed, obviously they have no numbers. Uh, so you cannot base uh, it on numbers at all. You can only do base it on two things. Mm -hmm. Number one is the founding team. And then number two is the business model itself. Sure. Uh, how likely is it to make money? How likely is it to grow and scale as much as you think it can be? Mm -hmm. So I would say it's a good 70-30. 70-30, so 70% based on the founding team, 30% business model. This is So this is pre-seed. Mm -hmm. So this is still at the 50 to 150K check size. Sure, and just one thing. Yeah. Uh, the definition of pre-seed has changed a lot uh, in the last two, three years. What is a pre-seed to you? Is it a working product uh, or, or is it a product with revenue? What is pre-seed? Uh, ah, so for pre-seed is, uh, for us, I think we just want to keep it as simple as possible. A company that's still fair, relatively new, uh, not yet having a uh, product market fit, uh, also pre-revenue as well. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. okay. So we're gonna jump to seed stage now. Yeah. So these, these, uh, I mean, this this check size can go a little bit bigger. So one for 150, let's say maybe to 500. Okay. I think that's kind of the sweet spot of what we like to do in terms of seed. Um, these companies maybe have a slight idea of PMF. Uh, maybe they have a little bit of revenue as well. Hmm. So this is what what we kind of classify as a seed fund. Mm -hmm. uh, at, at, so at this at this stage, you know, they do have a little bit more numbers. So the found, so the split between uh, what is important to us, maybe it's about fifty percent still founding team. Okay. Maybe thirty percent still business model and twenty percent the numbers. Numbers, yeah. Okay. Uh, but again, this could also differ between on different industries. Sure. Um, and next, we move on to Series A. So this can be a lot more subjective, as you know. Sure. Because the numbers can range from uh, a variation from 500 all the way to 3 million. But this is just sure. a quick example. Not all sure. our investments uh, go between these, uh, these numbers. Mm -hmm. um, but for them, they need to have revenue. 
Mm-hmm. They need to have product market fit. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think those are probably profitability. The- no, I think expecting profitability at such an early stage might hinder growth as well. Okay. So I think profitability should be a discussion for Series B. That's for Series B. For Series B, it should happen already from the beginning, but it should only take effect probably at Series B. Okay. Okay. Let's 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 complete this loop. Uh, how about Series B? Because you made a few investment in Series B as well. Uh, Saison as a uh, as a fund, so let's uh, talk about that as well. Sure. So Series B, um, I think the founding team, in terms of the percentage, is a lot smaller. The business model is something that actually takes way more effect now. Mm. So I would say maybe forty percent is business model. Mm. Maybe thirty percent is on the numbers. Thirty mm. percent is on the founding team. This is when the business model. Is, is no longer a startup, but sure. it's now an, a real business, sure. an actual business model that can work anywhere in the world. Mm-hmm. This is what a startup has to be, a switch between startup to corporate, almost pro- professionalizing uh, to corporate stage. And I think this is where Series B really matters. So they need to have obviously product market fit, they need to generate uh, revenue, and they need to start focusing on profitability as well. Interesting. Okay. And, and this, this check size can be any, yeah. any number. Sure. Anything sure. above three million. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So uh, while while you were while you were sharing this, you mentioned about let's say if it's a founder who's who's been someone from your last portfolio, past portfolio, and he's doing something new. Uh, let's let's expand more on that, right? Let's let's say that there's a founder, hypothetical way, hypothetical, who's basically tried. Uh, two startups in his past, uh, for whatever reasons have failed. Uh, and now it's a third one, sure. right? And they come to you, uh, you know them well. Uh, the general notion would be that, hey, listen, he has failed. I don't want to bet on it. But in venture capital world, it works the other way around, mm-hmm. right? Uh, in fact, a lot of VC are very excited if if they meet founders who've uh, who have tried uh, entrepreneurship in the past. Uh, yeah. For whatever reasons, they might not have worked. But they are more than happy and uh, excited to back these founders. Why is it so? What happens out there? Is it the experience which the founder carries or failure? Or what is it? Well, I think, first of all, uh, a little bit of context is kind of the quality of when you say serial entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. Uh, just because you started, you know, five businesses, but they all lasted maybe two weeks. Uh, most of the time, it doesn't really qualify you for that title. Sure. Uh, but a lot of people have done that, of course, to kind of boost their own reputation, well, I mean, which is totally fine. Everything has merit because everything is a learning experience. Correct. Correct. However, uh, I guess to qualify as a serial entrepreneur or a real serial entrepreneur is someone, someone who would have multiple exits. So past the seed stage. I think this is what uh, a very yeah. safe, which is very highly subjective uh, term. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, but this is what we kind of see. If, if someone says they're a serial ar- entrepreneur, they need to have a company that's, you know, at least one or two years old, exit in and then do it again and again. And then mm. they're a serial entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think when you see somebody like that, uh, regardless of whether it's the the two week one or the the one year one, mm-hmm. uh, it really depends on the on the on the person itself. You know, do they have the grit? Do they know for sure that now they have the right business model that they want to attack? Do they have the right team to work with them on on tackling this uh, specific problem? And what kind of product or service that they're willing to provide to help solve this problem and create value? So I think that's probably what we think. Every, again, everything is subjective. I can't really give you a straight answer. Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, but not is, expecting is, straight answers for this one. I but mean, this is this is yeah. exactly what we are what we're trying to see as well. So of course, grit is number one, right? Uh, mm. If you're gonna if you're willing to work hard, sacrifice your life to build something, mm-hmm. happy to give you the money, happy to fund you and fund uh, your idea. So because we also believe in your business model too. Sure, sure, great. Yeah. Right. How much? How much does should should uh? How much should an entrepreneur uh, draw salary? Oh, <laughs> also another subject. That's, that's a very good one. I, I love asking this question. Uh, that's a, I mean, it's a it's a good question. I probably get a lot of hate for this, uh, but I think hmm. I think you need to. I think in the early stages, you need to sacrifice a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, the long term gain of any founder is when the exit happens at IPO or a trade sale at Series B or post Series B. Hmm. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, you really have to kind of sacrifice to make sure that the business stays afloat and that you grow and that your costs aren't overinflated just for your personal well-being. Hmm. So hopefully, 
before you make a startup, you're not broke. You know, you have some sort of savings, you some some sort of cushion. Uh, hopefully, maybe your partner works as well, uh, or you can be comfortable in building a product um, and also taking you know a reasonable uh, salary or take home, and maybe uh, potentially some of your costs already associated with your business, so that you don't have to take uh, too much money out of your own personal money to pay those other expenses as well. Was this the case in uh, in in the hyper funding era of 2021? Uh, I think this has been kind of true since I joined 2018. Okay, I don't, I'm not too sure about uh, beforehand, but sure. since 2018, we've always seen companies where uh, the investors are very prudent with their founders, saying, "Hey, you know, please don't take too much of your salary because then your burn will increase." Correct, uh, and that's uh, a negative kind of uh, image when it comes to fundraising multiple rounds afterwards. So we want to make sure that uh, you guys know not to spend too much money. Uh, mm-hmm. If you do need to spend money, make make sure it's a business uh, expense. Make sure it's related to the business as well, sure. not on a personal level. Let Let me give you a counter argument. Sure. Okay. Uh, I completely agree. By the way, uh, what do you stand? Mm-hmm. Uh, very much with you. Uh, but there's a counter argument that hey, listen. Let's say I am a Series A uh, company. Sure. Let's assume I'm a fintech company. Okay. Right. And uh, I'm the CEO, co-founder of that fintech company. Now, if I put out an argument that hey, listen, if you are to hire a CEO from a, from the market, mm-hmm. uh, you give them uh, him or her an equity, yeah. Plus, there's gonna be a salary, sure, right? Uh, so, if you're gonna hire someone from the market, you're gonna pay them X, yeah. At least pay me X minus one. Why you are paying me X minus ten? Right. Well, here's the, yeah the counter. Yeah, um, is that if you are bringing in professionals, and there's a lot of startups who do that nowadays. Correct. They won't give them the same amount of equity that you probably had. Correct. Uh, they'll probably only give them anything from the ESOP pool, which is less than five to ten percent. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas at Series A, uh, a CEO maybe the, if there's only two or three co-founders, they will probably have forty or fifty percent uh, shares in the company, meaning your net worth is going to be much larger than that CEO. Correct. Uh, just because they get more salary on a monthly basis, your total net worth is still much higher. So, is That's it a counter offer? Sure. Is it is it fair to say <laughs> that uh, the VCs want founders to make wealth from the equity uh, as the end game, rather than draw large salaries? My my understanding of our industry, our whole tech industry, hmm. um, is that we want founders to stay as long as possible. Even after IPO, even after ten, twenty years, just like Mark Zuckerberg, just like Bill Gates before he stepped down, they were in these companies for a really, really long time. Correct. And this is exactly what we tell CEOs and C levels in any startup: we want to invest in your business, but we want you to take care of it. Sure. Because uh, it's it's oh, it's always possible to hire anybody, but for you, uh, from you building it from zero to what you are today, hmm. it should mean something. Sure. Obviously, we don't expect you to have an emotional connection to every business you make, but we want you to take kind of take care of it because you know it best. Mm-hmm. You are the best captain for this ship, and sure. I think this is what we believe in uh, as a whole. Uh, unless, of course, you're not the right fit. But if you are the right fit, please stay as long as possible. Sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, generally, from your experience, what do you think founders assume uh, uh, would be their exit time frame? Just from your experience, I mean, you 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 must be speaking to so many founders, yeah. uh, right? And you might get a get an idea of it. I'm I'm uh, purely asking; it's very speculative, mm-hmm. but just out of curiosity. Um, I mean, uh, there have been a few exits, but there haven't been the most um, amicable or nice uh, ways of parting ways. Uh, usually, it's because of conflict. Uh, but in general, uh, if a C level or a, a original founder does want to leave uh, for a specific reason, whether it's to build a new company, whether it's to do something else, you know, uh, usually after the company has become a little bit more professionalized, as I mentioned, mm-hmm. at that turning point of Series A to Series B, when you start hiring a lot more people to kind of make the company run not like a startup anymore, but more like a corporation, I think that's kind of an uh, probably the best time to do so. However, it's still relatively early than what we probably expect from the C level team, from the co-founding team. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's right. probably the earliest that is the most acceptable, unless there's of course something that happened beforehand. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. Let's let's talk about uh, 
let's talk about the companies within your portfolio which have wind up mm-hmm. right which have shut shop for whatever reasons uh let's talk from both perspectives right what happens once uh, uh once a company let's say say a lumo uh, shuts down right uh, so let's talk from both perspectives what happens to the company itself from sure. founder's perspective what happens to the investments which you have made uh, as a as a as a venture capital sure so i've also been in the situation personally so i can also share Please. my insights from that yeah, yeah, yeah. so from the company's perspective uh, you know it is a decision that's very very tough you know, first and foremost I think over the past two years, we've seen a lot of layoffs on the news, Mm -hmm. uh, which has been very disheartening for the whole industry. Um, So I think that's the first thing to do is, of course, talk to your board, talk to your uh, investors, make sure it's very clear that there is a plan to wind down the company. And the first thing to do, of course, is take care care of the people who take care of you. When when should a founder do this? At what stage? Like, for example, should it be based on the runway? Should it be based on the product market fit? Should it be, be? I mean, what should be the basis of it? Like that's a good question. Again, just just yeah. taking Lumo as an example, when there, wherein there's a large amount of fund still available. Uh, is that's that's what I've heard. The, there's a large amount of fund which was available, but it's more of the product market fit uh, uh, rather. So, at what stage uh, a founder should uh, founder or the founding team should go for this? Sure, that's actually a, a really fantastic question. Uh, for me, I can't really speak on Lumo too much. I don't have sure, sure. experience absolutely uh, with them. Uh, but for companies that I've been in, or I've uh, this in general, in it's general absolutely in general. Right. In general, uh, runway is obviously the number one component. If you have, uh, as I mentioned before, between each round, you need about uh, fourteen to eighteen months of runway. This is the standard anywhere in the world as a startup. Between seed to Series A to Series B, you need to have at least one and a half years. Sure. It is a very standard practice, right? Yeah. For fundraising, you need to have at least six months before your runway is over because it takes a long time to negotiate. Correct. And the less money you have, the more bargaining power these VCs have over you, yeah, which is not the ideal position you want to be in as a founder, sure. right? So you have to make sure that you plan everything thoroughly from 14 to 18 months, six months before that, maybe even 10 months before that. So what does that mean? So after six months, or maybe even after five months of fundraising, you have to start the com- conversations again, mm-hmm. which is obviously very, very uh, tedious and very annoying, but it is how we're supposed to to do it to make sure that our money is safe and, and, and always running. Mm. So from that perspective, runway is probably the number one factor, making sure that you have enough buffer to either build out a new business model to pivot or uh, for you to kind of wind down the company as well. Uh, and if there's no there's no time, then it's probably best to do it as soon as possible. Talk mm-hmm. to your investors and say, hey, we have to, you know, up the, pull, up, pull the plug, as they say, and we have to shut down the company. Mm-hmm. Or uh, do a last minute pivot. But sure. either way, you would have to f- kind of fire your, your, your team first. Let go of your team. Sure. Okay. So that's from the founder's side. Yeah. What happens uh, on the on the venture capital? I think it's a kind of a consensus play when it comes to the board. Uh, you do have multiple uh, VCs sitting on your board. Uh, uh, well, usually after C, uh, after seed round, you have multiple investors hmm. on your board, and they have, they would have to be in consensus as well because they have so many rights to stop everything you do hmm. in terms of big decisions like this. So they have to be in consensus, saying, "Okay, you know, we tried our best. Or we did our, you know, we worked hard." It's time to shut down the company. Of course, if one or two don't agree, they want to keep pursuing. Uh, there's always a, a, usually a tiebreaker mode or it really depends on who has more uh, say in the company. Sure. Uh, but you usually, especially during the pandemic, they, they would come to consensus and very quickly as well because mm-hmm. uh, they want to preserve as much possible cash within your, uh, uh, as a, a, a startup's company, which can be divvied back up to the VC. To the VC, exactly. But from the VC standpoint, it's pretty much written uh, as a write-off, mm. meaning uh, this company uh, will provide zero uh, in their accounting books. Mm. Yeah, sure. Okay, interesting, interesting. So let's uh, let's let's uh, let's go into a slightly different direction, sure. right? Uh, so uh, a company shuts down. Mm? Uh, the money is given back. Uh, let's say if there's money out there, it's given back to the venture capitals. Yeah. What is the sequencing of this? Because there are a lot of players out there, uh, a lot of investors, there are yes. angel investors yes. uh, who might or might not have exited the company. Then there are investors from the seed round, in some case, Series A as well. Uh, how does how does this sequencing flow? Uh, it really depends uh, uh, in terms of seniority. Uh, usually it's debt. Then you have like the preferred shareholders. Then you have common stock. I think, hmm. or, and also ordinary shares as well. 
So I think those are that's basically like the the basics. But of course, in every kind of legal writing, mm-hmm. uh, it could change. So yeah. you know, in every country, there's also different writings as well. Every every uh, kind of legal jurisdictions. Mm-hmm. So I cannot just say for sure that's how it's going to happen for every company. Mm-hmm. But usually, that's how it goes. Uh, you have kind of seniority and different types of investors, whether it's debt uh, and also your your investors as well. Sure, sure. They're stockholders. Sure. Let's let's talk about something which 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 generally is not spoken a lot about is about mismanagement of funds. Sure. Uh, we're hearing a lot more stories, uh, especially in twenty twenty three, where there's lot been lot of siphoning being happening yeah. or uh, or other kind of misconducts, especially financial misconducts. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you had any experience with this? Um, not personally, not personally, but, but companies that are close to me, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, why does it happen is very clear. It's pretty much green. Uh, or do you think it's something else not as well? Necessarily. Okay. Sometimes it's really just what do you call it? Bad processes. A, a, or a patsy. Patsy meaning someone to blame for. Okay. Uh, uh, so I mean. Uh, it could just be a reason to blame somebody uh, and put all kind of the bad images and the bad reputation of a company to this one person. And hmm. once he's let go, the company can start anew. So this is, okay. this is something that people don't really notice. When you see the news about maybe one C- CEO got caught with embezzlement, hmm. one, C- one CFO got caught with something else. Hmm. Sometimes it's not really the case. Sometimes uh, maybe they boosted GMV. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe they wrongfully, you know, uh, accrued different types of financial instruments. Yeah. Uh, it could just be a ploy to, to to kind of clear the air for the company in the future, hmm. which is not not everybody knows. Um, yeah, <laughs> no, no, I'm I'm sure, I'm sure. Yeah, no, I'm just talking about like there have been cases again. Yeah. I don't want to get into uh, name calling and then we go into detail. But uh, I mean, like there have been cases in India. There have there yeah. been cases elsewhere as well. I have heard that there are. Quite a few cases which have happened in Indonesia as well, but uh, no one wants to talk about it because uh, I mean it it doesn't help anyone. That's right, right? Unless let's say the venture capital wants to get rid of the uh, the founder, for True. example. True. Uh, let's talk about that. Yeah. No, but you're but you're definitely right. I think number one is greed. Uh, I mean, p- the pandemic was a hard time for everybody. Mm. Uh, people needed uh, additional sources of income, and what they would usually do is just basically siphon off their company, their startup. Which is sad because a startup also needs every bit of cash that they need. Uh, they exactly. Get. Um, but some people don't really think about you know the company as a whole. They think about them individual, individual, individualistically and egotistically. So, mm-hmm. uh, but no, it's it's very common. Um, there's a lot that have been that haven't been reported on e-commerce or online as well. Sure. Um, which luckily the you know the investors have kind of brushed under the rug. Yeah. Uh, but there are companies that around our ecosystem that have you know have gone through this. With multiple bad actors, not just one or two people, but multiple people. Sure, sure. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, VC founder conflicts. Sure. Uh, just, just in general, right? I mean, uh, of course, uh, founders commit certain numbers in terms of be it revenue growth or whatever. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the for- forecasts, and venture capitals once they're interested in your idea, they buy that forecast and they basically put in money mm. right now uh, conflicts can arise from uh, from various arguments yeah but in your experience in general what is the leading cause of these uh, uh, these tiffs when to shut down a company when to shut down a company i think that's number one uh I think okay especially during the pandemic does the, does this happen a lot uh, does it uh, happen a lot it does it comes a lot from the venture capitals that yeah. hey, listen, you're not going in the right direction. You better wind know. Yes, it happens yeah. a lot. Uh, I think they believe uh, most VCs believe that they have the foresight uh, better than, of course, the founders who uh, typically have force binders. You know, focusing on their business alone. But hmm. for for VCs, they believe since they know what's happening around the world that they can safely say, "Hey, I think it's time for you to shut down the business," and or think about moving to something else, either pivoting or building something else with a new entity. Uh, but this is probably the the well, especially in the past two years has been has been the biggest point of contention uh, because startup founders, of course, treat their companies like their babies. They obviously don't want to let it go ever, especially when they're still able to hang on or when there's still a slim chance of them to succeed. Mm. Mm. Even though financially, logically, uh, it would just make sense to you know uh, go part your ways and do something else. Mm. Um, 
but yeah, that's probably number one. Number two, I would think is, hmm, that's actually good. I never thought about this question. Number one was really obvious. Number two, not as obvious as I thought. Um, I guess just sharing numbers in general. Like get very annoyed. <laughs> okay, okay. I expand more on this. So, uh, in, in every SHA, uh, you know, shareholders uh, agreements and, and uh, share subscription agreements, there's a par- portion called information rights, mm-hmm. where VCs are legally allowed to request for data every whatever quarter or whatever uh, timeline that they, this presented in the information rights. Usually, it's monthly or quarterly, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and this obviously pisses off a lot of different startups because they just have no capacity to do this. But uh, it's needed for us. It's also needed for them as well. It's always good to keep track of what you're doing mm-hmm. on a monthly to quarterly basis and also present it to your investors. Uh, but that's probably the number, uh, the second point of contention. Hmm. Okay. okay. But in terms of conflict, uh, it, it varies. I've seen some uh, just plainly because of strategy. Sure. The, the other one is, you know, uh, whether it's expansion to uh, nationwide or expansion regionally. The other one is, you know, uh, hiring, uh, whether they want to hire specific people and the VC say, no, 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 we've done our DD. Uh, they're not good people, but, you know, they get along quite well. So it's a whole different thing as well. How involved venture capitals are in hiring? Oh, it really depends. Uh, there are some VCs who are completely hands off. There's some VCs who are completely hands-on and you have everywhere in between. So when it comes to hiring, it's very important because you want to make sure that the companies are taken care of and you have the right people in different departments within that startup. Correct. Hiring for a lot of people is important, Mm -hmm. but for some VCs, they don't really care. You know, it's your money, it's your business, you do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I would say a good 20 to 25%, uh, which is a lot, uh, actually do help and care about the hiring process. Oh, okay. Hiring, meaning uh, they probably have their own internal officers to help them hire, mm-hmm. uh, or maybe even have their own, you know, discounts when it comes to Michael Page or anyone else to help them hiring, mm-hmm. uh, or they have their own networks to to say, hey, you should hire this person for this specific role. Interesting. Twenty five percent is quite high. Ooh, well, that's that's pretty high. That's pretty high. Pretty high. Interesting. Let's talk about due diligences. Sure. Right. So, I mean, uh, uh, we've all heard stories about. Uh, money being wired in a week yeah. in 2021 yeah. uh, money being wired without without an MVP mm-hmm. just at the idea stage yeah. uh, now it has all changed of course I believe a lot more sanity is uh, back no 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 not yet no no okay never has changed. Never has changed. <laughs> okay, let's let's talk about this. Sure. Let's talk about uh, this. I mean, if we're talking about early stage investments, uh, it has become a little bit more competitive. Mm. There have been a lot more uh, new entrants in the market in terms of uh, pre-seed to seed stage investors. Sure. Uh, whether it's a family office, whether it's a uh, group of angels, whether, sorry, yeah. a syndicate of angels, whether it's a corporate trying to uh, do more corporate development or even helping them build that within their corporate uh, ecosystem. Hmm. So you have a lot more investors now, not just vanilla VCs, not just corporate VCs. You have <laughs> all walks of life, including hmm. just simply angels as well, yeah, right? Yeah. Rich, successful businessmen. With large uh, checks, yeah. Exactly, right? So what that causes is if you do have the opportunity to find an amazing investor, an uh, amazing startup, for example, on the same plane ride as you, hmm. on the same plane ride as you from Singapore, like, oh, you're you're making a startup on D2C, for example, which is kind of a hot commodity at the, at this mo- at the moment. Hmm. Uh, before they talk to other people, you can present them with a term sheet that you print literally uh, or send them a PDF uh, within the day, have them sign it, have a, a very short timeline, whether you have to sign this between the, uh, within the next five days or it will be uh, harmless or gone, terminated. Well, you give them that pressure and then you, get, you give them money within, within noon. I still see that till today. You still have our on Capital in the past year, we have given uh, money, money in the bank within three weeks. Wow. Well, with okay. three weeks. Okay. A very rare case. But yeah. yeah, three weeks. Yeah. But in general, the uh, the due diligence has gone better. It, it has gone a lot better. It has gone a lot more uh, structured compared to just looking at LinkedIn for their mutual connections to see mm. whether he's a good, uh, he or she is a good person or not. Mm. Uh, two, actually looking at their numbers, looking at bank statements, looking at the, kind of their behaviors and patterns of how they kind of run their business as well. Uh, so I think that part, of course, it really depends on the stage, but it has gotten a lot better. Uh, but as we, as as we're talking, you know, the seed and pre a, uh, pre seed stage, there's really not that many numbers, so you can't really digest a lot from that. So what you have to do is go from more on the personal route. 
So Saison as as a as as a venture fund itself, uh, is it is it more focused at, in this environment? Is it more focused toward very early stage uh, funding, or uh, it's still a balance? It's still pretty much a balance. Uh, we like to say we're early stage uh, folks, you know, from pre seed all the way to uh, Series A. Uh, because we we have that corporate right, you know, hmm. we can come in at eighty million with debt uh, equity, hmm. but we can. I mean, we we typically give anywhere between one hundred k to three million, hmm. which our sweet spot is around five hundred k. So I'd say we're we're still pretty much balanced because we also help identify for our parent company as well. But you do you haven't done much of late stage investments in twenty twenty three, right? Uh, or in general, also the late stage investments in twenty twenty three have been very very low. Uh, uh, right. That's also a good point. Uh, the 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 latter is also very true. But for us, um, we actually recently did one. But in terms of the number count, early stage is is, is way way more uh, prominent compared to growth stage. How how do uh, okay? L- this might be a bit a bit tricky one, but okay, let me just throw it out to you. Uh, again, very hypothetical. Let's say I am I am. A founder who raised my series A during the boom period in 2021, late 2021, early 2022, sure. at uh, uh, at let's say a 200 million valuation, right? Now I am sitting 18 months down the lane yeah. uh, from my last funding round. Uh, I don't have a very long runway. I need to raise money. But it's very difficult to justify that valuation, mm-hmm. uh, which was pumped up at that period due to positive sentiments or whatever was the scenario back then right yeah now i'm getting i am will, the, there are investors who are willing to fund me when they're willing to fund me let's say at a 50 million or a 60 million right so that's like a 70 percent uh slash out there uh let's talk from both sides again right i want i i don't want to have only one-sided views on both sides right sure. so uh from a founder's perspective well i mean he wants to keep the lights on Right. Uh, he might have made adjustments. He might have fired people, uh, fired team folks, adjusted expenses, but still the runway is still small. Right. And needs money to survive to pull it off. Mm-hmm. But whereas his previous investors don't see it, uh, how do they see it? How do how does a previous investor see it? Uh, I I think everyone now uh, has realized their mistake and overvaluing companies at the wrong time. So I don't think there are any investors at the moment who are going to be that upset when a company does have a down round. I think they'll be happy that they even have a round in general. Okay. So I don't think uh, they're going to be, I mean, obviously 200 million to 60 million is massive. Hmm. Maybe they can kind of just just give an example. Yeah. Go somewhere in between. Uh, But regardless, uh, I think they'll be happy that there is any new investor who is interested in their, in their portfolio company. Uh, from the founder side, yeah, they're happy that they're getting any money uh, to general. survive. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. How do valuations work at Series A? Um, so Series A, I mean, the rule of thumb is uh, uh, anything you raise. Uh, well, back in my day, <laughs> Series A uh, used to be you know anywhere between one to five million, and then from there you would just kind of um, uh, a typical Series A round would comprise of a lead investor, maybe some follow-on investors, and maybe a new ESOP pool. So this is roughly about 20 to 25%. So from that number, whether, whether let's say it's 5 million, you times it by four or five, whether it's 20 to 25%, and that's kind of your valuation at Series A. Um, so typically, whatever you raise at Series A times it by four, four to five is kind of the valuation range you're looking at. Um, so yeah, uh, well, 20, uh-huh. 25, her mm-hmm. in specific scenario. Okay. So I mean, it, it, it is not a revenue multiple or anything of those? Um, rarely it is based on numbers, uh, solely on the fact that sometimes Series A companies don't have numbers uh, back in the day. Now, uh, even even until now, some of them don't have strong enough figures to back up their valuations, whether it's based on GTV or GMV. Uh, it's really just based on the amount that you're willing to, to offer a startup. Uh, if they're uh, past uh, the seed stage, they really have product market fit. They're going a little bit. Um, you know, they have their kind of sales engine turned on, uh, and they need about five million dollars. That's a, probably a really good starting point, right? Uh, you do have kind of a sanity check, which this which relates to your question. The sanity check is, you know, the multiple of successful companies in your field. For example, you are a fintech model. Let's say you're doing uh, insure tech. 
and then you're looking at successful insurance models around the world and you're looking at their trading uh, trading multiples on their uh, respective stock market, it's, uh, you're saying, oh, they're, uh, they're trading 1x of their uh, gross premiums that they, that they sold. So you can also use that metric as well for your startup. Mm -hmm. um, their valuation at 20, 20, 25 million, as I mentioned, uh, maybe it's 1x or maybe it's half of what they, uh, what they have uh, sold as their gross you know, written premiums. So it really depends on the market, really depends on the different industries. Uh, but there are different sanity checks, but in, in very rarely do you use those as a basis for valuation. It's always from the top down, not sure. from the bottom up. Sure. If I didn't get that wrong. <laughs> no, you did, you did, you did. Okay, uh, let me ask this question. I think you, uh, we might need to break this question down into two parts in terms of an answer. Sure. Uh, do you think uh, that the funding environment is getting better anytime soon? Uh, that is number one. Second, if it does not, uh, unfortunately, we'll have a lot of zombie startups. Mm -hmm. uh, how does this pan out? <laughs> oh, man, I, th I mean, probably the hardest question you asked today. Uh, I think number one. I was saving it. Huh? I was saving it. You're saving <laughs> it. Perfect. Um, I think number one, um, in regards to, is it getting better? Ye Yes, I think there are a lot of investors who have successfully fundraised uh, after the pandemic. Um, so there is a new kind of influx of cash, uh, which means startups have a great chance of fundraising now, uh, especially since a lot of the different entrepreneurs have not yet come back to the entrepreneurship route. Most of them went back to corporate to get steady income for their livelihood. Mm. So now you're still seeing um, a relatively small supply of startups within Indonesia's ecosystem uh, that does require funding. Uh, but the VCs, however, um, the supply of funding is still relatively high. Mm -hmm. We still have funds who raise pre-pandemic, who raise post-pandemic. And, and these are funds uh, like vanilla funds that have usually a 10-year period to kind of invest all of their Correct. Money. So that's the answer for number one. I would say, yes, it's a, a lot better time. However, there's a little bit of a caveat. Um, things might change soon uh, in terms of geopolitically. As we know, elections are happening in Jakarta, Correct. Indonesia in the next uh, four months. Uh, plus, you know, uh, big rumors of recession again in in, 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 in in America. And of course, everything that's happening around the region as well, uh, globally. Sure. Uh, number two, what was there? Uh, number two again, sorry? Yeah, the number two was that if the environment remains mm -hmm. the way it is, we'll yeah. end up having a lot of zombie startups. Startups who have raised yeah. decently a large seed round. The, look, the problem is that if you've raised a, a large seed round, you get used to buying growth. Yeah. By, by, by Buying growth might not be the right term, but you get used to throwing money at problems. Mm -hmm. uh, you really don't know uh, how to frugally build things. Uh, and then you reach a certain stage where you just got like six months or seven months runway left. Uh, and you're not able to raise around from yeah. outside, right? So that basically creates, you, I mean, you end up having a lot of zombie startups in the ecosystem mm. who are basically six months away, nine months away, ten months away uh, from, that's a, from extinction. That's a good point. So what, what, I've saw, what I saw during the pandemic was two things. Number one is uh, more trade sales. And number two uh, was more consolidations. So the trade sales, meaning a lot of corporates, um, they realize a lot of these startups actually have really good services or products. Mm -hmm. So they would just take them for themselves. That's sure. number one. Very simple, very easy acquisitions, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, both of these are related to m &A. Gives good multiples to venture capitals? No. No. Okay. No. Uh, relatively flat rounds or maybe just a little bit of upside. Upside, okay. Uh, but it's better than nothing, right? Yeah, sure, uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. And then the second one, which I see, which is very creative, is companies that are joining forces. Mergers mm -hmm. happening in the startup space that are typically for companies that are not even related, mm -hmm. you know, uh, maybe one is logistics, maybe the other one is pharmacy, but they put it together. Now they have a pharmaceutical log logistics company. Mm. So we saw this a lot. And I think those zombie companies are going to have to realize, hey, we need other people to kind of differentiate us from the different uh, other players, mm. uh, give us an edge and maybe give us better product or service capabilities that we'd never had before mm. by joining forces together, which I thought was really cool. And do you think that's happening? Oh, no. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's happening a lot, but I think it's beginning to happen now. The conversations are out there. Correct. And there have been a few companies that have kind of merged together to form one new company, which is uh, very cool for me. Very, very cool to see. Interesting. 
Yeah. Okay. It just, I mean, whatever extends your one way, whatever extends uh, your presence within the market and also for you not to die is mm-hmm. probably the best thing for you. Right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, exactly. I completely agree. Yeah. Completely agree. Again, let's let's talk about the flavor of the season. Sure. Uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah. And everything around it. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts? Oh, man. Um, I, I, I don't want to sound too contrarian, but uh, I don't believe any startup can succeed in the AI space uh, because the other bigger companies, OpenAI, Google, mm. they're already massive. Their data sets are just infinite. Correct. Uh, there is absolutely no way you can beat them at their own game. Mm-hmm. A lot of what well, a lot of companies, what are they? What they're doing now is basically just kind of wrapping around a chat sheet. Yeah, they're building they're building around the peripheries, building Correct. additional services on top of it. Correct. And mm. and it's just too. Um, sometimes, you know, a startup is just a feature and not an actual company. Hmm. And most of these are just features, uh, which we don't think um, can last long enough and to fight all the different competitors around the market. Uh, so I think AI is a very, very, very hard push. Um, we obviously believe AI is very helpful in our daily lives, in our business lives, in our corporate lives. But uh, investing in AI is, is, has been um, quite tough and will continually uh, be very tough. Okay. So I mean, uh, like with, with even with that perspective, today you have an open AI. I mean, mm-hmm. some something which started five years back uh, didn't show, or they were not sure of how they're going to monetize even until last year, and now they are a multi-billion-dollar uh, company. Sure. So you don't think you should? I mean, or any investors? Uh, or don't you think investors are looking at, let's say, deep tech company, or uh, or do you feel that there are more and more startups coming around as features yeah. rather than real product? Well, I think um, if you if you if you know a company called Trashio, they were very dependent on Amazon's fulfillment um, uh, system, hmm. but they recently shut down. So why was that? It's if if a company is too reliant on a dependency, a, exactly, hmm. dependent on one company that's not even theirs or closely related to them. Uh, you you just don't have the bargaining power, the leverage to 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 be big by yourself. So I think this is exactly what's happening within the AI space is that they're building around ChatGPT. They're 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 masking themselves with ChatGPT, powered by ChatGPT. Hmm. At the end of the day, it's still open AI. Yeah, that's still powering everything, right? Yeah, yeah. And without them, if you're not if you don't own a, uh, open API, then you're pretty much just lost uh, within all the different competitors. So it's a very tough market to invest in. Sure. So you guys have made any investments in AI companies? No. No, no. Okay. Uh, how about creator economy, especially in Indonesia? Yeah. Uh, what do you think of creator economy as a segment? Yeah, I think creator economy, the gig economy, is something that's that's awesome, especially that, especially during the pandemic where you could only stay at home. Uh, mm. People needed to find other ways to make money. Uh, people needed to help push brands, uh, goods, and everything. And so because traditional above the line or below the line marketing did not work during the pandemic. Correct. Uh, so I think, that, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an awesome way uh, to see the creativity, of course, with a lot of different, uh, especially the younger folk in, in each of our uh, ecosystems. Uh, and I think it's here to stay. I think it's hard um, to build a platform for them. Mm-hmm. I, I think as a creator itself, um, it's a great time because you have multiple options. But as a as a platform maker, um, it's very hard for for them to also be very sticky uh, with these creators as well. Uh, but overall, I, the the market is is amazing and um, something that's very exciting for a lot of the different players. Sure, I mean there are there are quite a few startups who are in the creator economy space, be yeah. it be it from bringing together them on a platform yeah. or be it financing them uh, and a lot more. Uh, have you guys invested or do you do you th- feel that this is a hot sector? Uh, asking this for a reason that, hey, listen, if there's someone who's building in this mm-hmm. and if you feel that this is what is exciting you guys as a fund, maybe we can we get a finder's fee. <laughs> I mean, we're always happy uh, to meet anybody and, and discuss different business models. Uh, I don't think we've, we have one yet within our 100 portfolio companies. Um, I will double have to double check. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, but no, definitely something that's within our radar. Okay, yeah. okay. Ed tech, definitely not. Oh, ev- everything is on the table. Everything is on the table. Everything is on the table. Okay, everything. So if someone's able to figure out who's gonna pay, yeah, within the ed tech, please uh, reach out. Exactly. Whether it's the municipalities, the governments, anyone, sure. right? Sure, sure, sure. 
Let's talk about fintech, yeah. And you, you guys have really doubled down on uh, fintech since uh, the inception of the fund that, uh, mm-hmm. itself. Uh, how, what do you think of the fintech landscape in Indonesia today? I think it's it's um, very matured. Uh, I don't think the progress is what everybody expects it to be at this stage in terms of how many people have been uh, banked from the unbanked sector from before. Uh, I don't have the numbers with me today. Uh, but I think the progress in terms of awareness, especially during the pandemic, which is kind of a double-edged sword, but during the pandemic, a lot of people are a lot more used to apps, a lot more um, open to using uh, different neobanks as well, not, not uh, branchless banks. Uh, is what I mean, mm. uh, and also credit cards, uh, which before they would never right touch a mm. credit card. So I think I'm sure and assuming that it has increased, but mm. not to the level that we expected maybe five, six years ago. Mm. Uh, hopefully, this this trend does continue moving forward. But I think in Indonesia itself, uh, a lot of the different sectors are have matured. For example, P two P lending, um, you know, uh, business lending. Uh, a lot of these things have already. Uh, we really can't innovate more than what we have at the moment, right? So we really have companies uh, that are also planning to go IPO, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, who are also looking at uh, more more niche markets as well. Sure. Um, but no, I think in general, the whole fintech landscape is very healthy um, and always surprising me in what's coming out of it every year. Very nice. Yeah. Nice. Okay, I think we are towards the end of this chat. Uh, is there anything which you wanted to discuss and have not asked you mm, something which I you want to share i think the thing that i forgot to mention is how much uh importance uh each dd takes part in each stage uh scene sure uh, series a and also uh, yeah. Uh, yeah let's let's start, let's talk about that i think um as you mentioned before you know it's very simple dd uh from a vc side when it comes to an early stage company like mm-hmm. uh, pre a uh pre seed or seed because there really isn't that much information. Hmm. But something I didn't want, I didn't highlight yet was Series A, was that there's a lot uh, that goes on to it. Uh, this is where a lot of VCs actually hire outsourcing companies to help kind of help them uh, find these things because it's very hard to do everything internally. Correct. Uh, so for Series A companies, especially, this process takes more than most of the time two months uh, at a minimum because one month is just for DD of these all these different outsource vendors. Uh, to the company, whether it's legal DD, uh, technical DD, meaning their code base, Correct. everything, or even talking to their team, financial DD, looking at their bank statements, making sure everything is correct, making sure, as you said, there's no uh, hanky panky going around yeah. in the numbers. Um, so this this actually takes a long time, and it also is very costly. It takes a few grand, and this is why in the Series A, it's usually about fifty thousand dollars spent l- just on legal wow. uh, alone. And the vendors uh, within this uh, kind of time frame, because after that one month, you start, um, as I mentioned, the SSAs and the SHAs. Those take a long time as well to kind of go back sure. and forth between the Absolutely. founders and the and the and the VCs. So that's a whole two month process right there. Compared to when you're looking at seed companies, hmm. you're literally just giving them a term sheet. Oh, I like you as a founder. You know, a lot of people say good things about you. Here's you know five hundred thousand sure. dollars. So though, that's probably the biggest difference between Series A and and the uh, kind of. Prior rounds. Oh, that, that's, that's absolutely helpful. Yeah. Thank you so much, RJ. I think this was really great. Uh, we spoke about a lot of things which generally is not discussed. Uh, so I'm glad we did this. Uh, thank you once thank again you for doing this. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>